B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Tuesday, April 3rd, 2018. Our stable genius president is unhinged once again. Spreading fear and displaying his own paranoia about a so-called caravan moving from Honduras through Mexico to the southern border of these United States. And Trump is threatening to deploy the American military along our border. And yesterday I mentioned this. This evokes uh, rich and dark memories from the early 1990s here in California when Pete Wilson was desperate to get reelected as governor. And so he seized on an issue that polled very well about illegal immigration. And his ad mavens created this memorable commercial. The ad and the ballot measure did succeed in getting Pete Wilson reelected, but the expense has been to Republicans here in California ever since. They keep coming. Two million illegal immigrants in California. The federal government won't stop them at the border, yet requires us to pay billions to take care of them. Governor Pete Wilson sent the National Guard to help the Border Patrol. But that's not all. For Californians who work hard, pay taxes, and obey the laws, I'm suing to force the federal government to control the border. And I'm working to deny state services to illegal immigrants. Enough is enough. Governor Pete Wilson. So, uh, Wilson's ballot measure, 187, was overturned by the courts. Four-fifths of it was found to be unconstitutional. And the one-fifth part related to state services for uh, undocumented residents. But this overreach cost the Republicans big time. And, unfortunately, in the current climate, I can't predict the same for Trump's move. And I do want to raise a question that I don't know the answer to. Historically, under what was called posse comitatus, it was considered unconstitutional to deploy American military inside the United States. Now, the border is uh, the border. And I guess you could say, well, that's not inside the U.S. That's to defend us from these hordes of Hondurans who want to come here and apply for political asylum. Now, Trump sees that as this incredible threat. And he loves the drama of at least talking about deploying the military. If there are any experts out there who know the status of posse comitatus, I do recall that during the Bush era, there were efforts to modify that, although I consider it a constitutional principle that would require a constitutional amendment. So, hence my fuzziness on that issue. But uh, at a White House briefing today with some uh, visitors from the Balkans, I'm sorry, the Baltic nations, he said, we have very bad laws for our border. We're going to be doing some things. I've been speaking with General Mattis. We're going to be doing things militarily. Until we can have a wall and proper security, we're going to be guarding our border with the military. That's a big step. We really haven't done that before, or certainly not very much before. And then in one of his annoying tweets, Trump the bully threatens Mexico and also Honduras. He says the big caravan, capital C, of people, capital P, from Honduras, capital H, (laughs) now coming across Mexico and heading to our weak laws border, had better be stopped before it gets there. Cash cow NAFTA is in play, as is foreign aid to Honduras and the countries that allow this to happen. Congress, now all caps, must act now. Now consider how you would respond if you're the leader of Honduras. You owe your post to the United States because we have interfered in the elections in Honduras twice in the last two elections. At the same time, the reason people are leaving Honduras is that the country is largely ungovernable. And there are gangs that originated in the United States that are now very powerful in Honduras and Guatemala. And, of course, Trump just turns a blind eye to all of that and imagines that he can just decree 
because he is Prince, King, <laughs> Duke, Donald? It is astounding. And, of course, what is the real threat of these caravans? Well, it's obviously, you can call it a stunt or a movement. But these groups are trying to make a point by moving toward the U.S.-Mexico border. And the organizers of the group are now splitting up their members so it's not as visible and the nation of Mexico is trying, at least making noises, uh, about trying to dissuade some people from coming to the United States by granting asylum to them in Mexico. And so Trump is once again creating a, a, a dramatic scene, trying to create a crisis that does not exist, trying to falsely induce people to think that a border wall would somehow stop this. And we know that most of the drugs that are coming in from South America come in through ports of entry. Or they come on the, on the ocean. There have been major efforts to interdict cocaine on the Pacific. And a wall won't do diddly about any of that stuff. But in his simple-mindedness and the way he panders to people who are simple-minded and low-information Americans, I guess it works. Meanwhile, Trump's trade war has produced a new response from China. And my California wine industry is taking a hit. Tech companies are uncertain about whether parts or even finished products will end up being subject to Trump's tariffs. And, of course, this has basically caused the evaporation of what was the Trump bump. The stock market went up under Trump mostly because greedy people figured he was going to give them what they wanted. But because of the uncertainties that Trump produces on a daily basis, the market is uh, uh, you know, whipsawing back and forth. And this was the kind of wild swings in the market that we've seen before crashes in the past. And Trump may, in fact, wreck our economy as he tries to pursue his obsession with trade issues. And I've told you before, I am not a free trader. I support comprehensive and thoughtful ways of trying to balance trade and protect the interests of Americans and American workers. But this is just so ad hoc, so arbitrary, that we have to turn to corporate leaders. <laughs> and let me say that this is not my first choice. But we've seen that in response to the Parkland shooting and other gun violence events, it was corporate leaders, like retailers, who said, okay, we get the message. We're not going to sell semi-automatics. We're going to stop selling bump stocks. We're going to regulate ourselves. Now, I know that doesn't work on Wall Street, but it's corporate leaders like General Electric and Goldman Sachs who are warning the White House that this is very risky business that could tank our economy. And yesterday, the stock market dropped another 2%. Uh, investors are described as spooked, and uh, it it does <laughs> it does have an impact. Uh, my retirement is tied up in the stock market, and when I see it go down, it's I think, well, gosh, should I get a job at Burger King? <laughs> so uh, this is uh, going to be a wild ride. I mentioned the wine industry, American wine exported to China totaled $82 million last year, a seven-fold increase. So California wineries have been working hard to develop markets in China, and they already pay what amounts to a 50% tariff. So China just added another 15%, and the example explained in this news story is that a wholesale $25 bottle of Napa Cabernet after all the taxes and the new tariffs, will sell in China for the equivalent of 100 U.S. dollars. 
Well, Trump's wrecking crew is making a whole lot of progress. And while we're distracted by his bimbos and his angry tweets on Easter about immigrants, Nick Mulvaney over at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is asking Congress to cripple the agency that he has been put in charge with temporarily. And he wants to ask Congress to change the way it's budgeted so that Congress and politics will be involved in any future programs at the Consumer Financial Protection Board. He's also recommending the Bureau rules be subject to legislative approval, which means there won't be any. And he says the president should have direct oversight and authority over the Bureau's director, and the law was explicitly written to prevent that. Next week, Mulvaney is scheduled to appear before Congress to testify <clears throat> about the agency, and you can expect Elizabeth Warren, the senator from Massachusetts, to uh, give him quite a ride. So Scott Pruitt, the Koch brothers' favorite guy in Washington, next to Mike Pompeo, I guess, well, he is doing the president's bidding, the Koch brothers' bidding, and despite the whiff of scandal around him that we'll detail in a moment, Trump has said, We've got your back, Scotty. Keep your head up. It's kind of his equivalent to Bush's, you're doing a hell of a job. Scotty, or who, who was that guy? <laughs> Brown, Brownie. That's, it was Brownie. And the wimpy so-called Democratic senator from Alabama, Doug Jones, has said that he thought Pruitt was on his way out. Even big fat Chris Christie, the former Trump transition chief, said that Pruitt should have never been there in the first place. Pruitt wants to be attorney general when Jeff Sessions' uh, meter runs out. And he has also talked about running for president the next time there's a Republican opening. Now, the other scandal is that Scott Pruitt spent a good part of his first year as uh, EPA director crashing at a Capitol Hill condo owned by industry lobbyist, energy industry lobbyist, Stephen Hart and his wife. And Stephen Hart got all kinds of sweet deals from Scott Pruitt's EPA while Scott was paying 50 bucks a night, and he only had to pay rent when he actually rested his head there. So that is a sweetheart deal. It's the, the best deal you can get in Washington unless you want to sleep under a bench at Union Station. And, of course, Scott Pruitt has uh, been dinged for flying first class, and I think he did the lease a corporate jet once or twice. And that got other people bounced from the Trump administration. But not Scotty. And the other thing he announced was the start of a process to roll back the increased targets that were set by the Obama administration for what are called CAFE standards, the mileage on fleets of cars. And the target was that by, what, 2050, we were going to get up to 54 miles a gallon. It's, it's an odd number. At any rate, uh, they're trying to start a process to eviscerate that. California will be probably exempted because since 1970, we've had a waiver under the Clean Air Act that allows California and 12 other states to make up their own more stringent rules about uh, auto emissions and uh, mileage standards. Governor Moonbeam responded by saying this must be a belated April Fool's Day trick. This cynical and meretricious abuse of power will poison our air and jeopardize the health of all Americans. Jerry's got a good vocabulary. Let's give him 10 points for meretricious. And Mary Nichols, chief of the California Air Resources Board, she helped set the standard that Pruitt wants to roll back, said that the EPA decision is politically motivated, has no documentation, evidence, or law to back it up. This is not a technical assessment, Nichols said. It is a move to demolish the nation's clean car program. Every day I pause and thank the people who support my work with your subscriptions to the Peter B. Collins podcast. People from all over the world kick in 5 10 sometimes $20 a month, a lot of people take out that $50 annual subscription. And today I want to honor Julie Dupree, Jim McHugh, the folks at DGL, and our friend Sandra Fish. 
They're all generous supporters of this podcast, and I invite you to join them. Just visit PeterBCollins.com. There's a menu tab no matter how you get there, no matter what you use. Click on that. Click on Become a Subscriber. You land on the sign-up page. And uh, Robert Blumen is renewing his annual subscription. He hates PayPal, so he's going to mail a check to my P.O. Box. That's Box 150-660, San Rafael, California, 94915. Box 150-660, San Rafael, California, 94915. Well, Trump has come up with a new legal maneuver to try to dodge the Stormy Daniels case. He and his lawyer, Michael Cohen, who's got his own problems, which are growing, they have asked a federal judge to order private arbitration in the case brought by Stormy Daniels. Now, she wants to be freed from a gag order. She's offered to return the $130,000 in hush money. But Trump is trying to hold her to silence on the affair that he continues to deny. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> here in the United States, the silence is deafening in response to Israel's gross and disproportionate assault on unarmed Palestinian protesters last Friday. A total of 17 were killed. The number of wounded is in the hundreds. And only Bernie Sanders on one of the Sunday TV shows said, yeah, I, I don't support Israel on this. I think that was wrong. I think it was disproportionate. But look at the silence of virtually every other politician, broken only by the U.S. ham-fisted effort to block a U.N. call for an investigation using our veto powers to defend Israel's defenseless actions. And I want to thank Ian Berman. He's a, a stout supporter and listener to this podcast. He posted on Facebook a commentary from Maya Wind. And she is described as a uh, Jewish-Israeli woman who used to be a conscientious objector. And in a piece that she called the, I, I guess uh, Ian wrote the title, which he chose, The Morality of the Warsaw Ghetto. And Maya Wind writes, the liberal Zionist newspaper Haaretz, the so-called mainstream left publication in Israel, runs a front-page op-ed by its senior military correspondent, Amos Harrell, titled, Instead of Rockets and Tunnels, Hamas Found an Effective Method of Friction with the IDF. And she notes, this has become the mainstream narrative in Israel. When Palestinians demand their freedom, they're actually trying to cause provocations that make Israelis look bad and therefore cause them harm. In another op-ed at Haaretz, Kemi Shalev says, Hamas may succeed in mounting a protest that forces the IDF to kill unarmed civilians. And Maya Wind decodes this. In other words, Palestinians are blamed not only for their own deaths, but also for exposing the bad optics of occupation to the world. This paraphrases the long-standing Zionist logic expressed by Prime Minister Golda Meir who famously said, we will never forgive the Arabs for forcing our children to kill them. And then, we will never forgive the Arabs for forcing us to kill their children. Maya Wind continues, Harrell's article then begins with the damning words, this was not a calm protest. Israel holds millions of Palestinians in an open-air prison in unlivable conditions. When Palestinian activists march unarmed to the fence in front of Israeli snipers, resulting in 17 deaths and hundreds injured, Israelis decry that the protest was not calm. Israelis are so used to being the ruling class that they believe they can not only dictate that protests against their violent occupations be nonviolent, but that they be calm. There are no means of Palestinian resistance that Israel finds acceptable. What is outrageous is that Israelis continue to spout this rhetoric only hours after their soldiers murder and injure protesters who are trying to express their humanity in front of their colonizers. And she ends, there are no words left. This article in the New York Times today caught my attention about the Israel-Palestine situation. And the quote comes from Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia. Now, I want to begin by going to the end of the article, or toward the end, to read the full quote, 
from the crown prince. He gave it to Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic. Quote, I believe that each people anywhere has a right to live in their peaceful nation. I believe the Palestinians and the Israelis have the right to have their own land. But we have to have a peace agreement to assure the stability for everyone and to have normal relations. So that's the full quote. It talks about both Israelis and Palestinians having their own land. But the article byline Ben Hubbard opens like this. Saudi Arabia's powerful crown prince has said that Israelis have the right to have their own land and that formal relations between Israel and the kingdom could be mutually beneficial. Now, that is a spin and bias that I can't rationalize. Now, it might be fair to say that Palestinians already have their own land and Israel is on contested land, so the real news in this story is that MBS supports land for Israel. But that's bullshit. And while I have no trust, faith, or confidence in Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and his intentions toward the Palestinians, I think he wants to throw them under a big Israeli bus and call it a peace deal and cram it down their throats. But in this case, he offered a balanced statement that was seized upon and spun up as a pro-Israeli comment by the New York Times. Now, while I'm exposing media malpractice, let's turn to BuzzFeed. They've been a major promoter of the conclusions drawn without evidence by the British government, without public evidence at least, that Sergei Skripal was poisoned or attempted to, to be killed, assassinated, using a nerve agent called Novichok. And Craig Murray the former British ambassador to Uzbekistan, who blogs about these issues on a regular basis, he was the first who drew my attention to his claim that sources that he had at the chemical weapons lab in Britain called Porton Down, located only 12 kilometers from Salisbury, where this incident occurred, that the scientists there did not establish Russian responsibility now, apparently they're splitting the specimen, if you will, and they're saying, yes, it was the military-grade nerve agent that we classify as Novichok. But Gary Aitkenhead, the CEO of Defense Science and Technology Laboratory, more commonly known as Porton Down, told Sky News that his team was able to identify it as Novichok. But we have not verified the precise source. We provided the scientific info to government, who have then used a number of other sources to piece together the conclusions that they have come to. What's he doing? He's covering his ass. He's saying that the government is making a case based on intelligence that I haven't seen. And he's diplomatically not agreeing with it, but he's separating himself from it in case the shit hits the fan or the Novichok turns out to be Diet Pepsi. I've linked to the story in BuzzFeed. You can peruse it for yourself. Also in Britain, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, let me say that again, Jeremy Corbyn, who is the leader of the Labour Party, has been smeared for not enthusiastically jumping on board with Theresa May's claim that it was Novichok, that it was Russia that was responsible, that Putin engineered it, and therefore the expulsion of diplomats and the other moves that have been made in the past month are justified, but uh, Jeremy Corbyn just is not sufficiently on board with this. Well, the smears against Corbyn reached a new low because over the weekend he attended a Passover Seder organized by a group of English Jews called Judas, spelled J-E-W-D-A-S. That appears to be a pun on the apostle named Judas, the guy who turned on Jesus in the Bible story, right? Well, Judas is a left-wing Jewish group that's highly critical of mainstream Jewish organizations and of Israel. And, of course, that's automatically tagged as anti-Semitic. The Times, uh, New York Times continues, Judas describes itself as a forum for radical voices for the alternative diaspora. It has called Israel a steaming pile of sewage, while criticizing those who organized recent protests against anti-Semitism in the Labor Party. Well, this is an effort to impose orthodoxy. 
And it's similar to what's going on in the United States. If you criticize the policies and the state of Israel for those policies, you are flatly assumed to be anti-Semitic. And this is a very, very dangerous move, a wave that continues around the globe. And it's part of the reason for the silence after Israel's crackdown on the Palestinians and the sniper fire that killed 17 on Friday. And listen to this condescension from uh, Professor Fielding. What is his name here? Uh, Criticizing Corbyn, he says he has an implacable binary worldview. He sees Israel as Zionist, and Zionism is part of imperialism, and imperialism as the part of the enemy. And what is wrong with seeing Israel as Zionist? What is wrong with seeing Zionism as imperialism? These are difficult times, friends. Robert Mueller got his first official scalp as a judge sentenced Alex van der Zwan, a Dutch citizen who lives in London, who was a lawyer to Paul Manafort. He's getting 30, day, 30 days in jail and has to pay a $20,000 fine. Now, I expect tonight Rachel Maddow is going to be jumping up and down about this and praising Bob Mueller and saying, look, but Alex van der Zwan took the plea but he didn't agree to become a state informant. He is not cooperating with Mueller, and I'm surprised he only got a 30-day sentence with that as a factor. And he may well have information that ties Paul Manafort to Russian operatives. But we haven't seen it, and based on this this whole outcome, it's not going to come from Alex Vanderswan. At least that's my current guess. At the uh, same time, Mueller filed a 53-page response to the motion from Manafort's lawyers to dismiss the charges, claiming that Mueller didn't have appropriate jurisdiction, that the instructions from the Justice Department at his hiring didn't include Manafort's corruption, his tax evasion, the millions of dollars that he extracted from the oligarch who ran Ukraine, Yanukovych. But the response memo reveals that Rosenstein, Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general who Mueller reports to, issued a confidential memo last August detailing areas that Mueller had the authority to investigate, and among those were specific allegations involving crimes arising out of payments that Manafort received from the Ukrainian government before and during the tenure of Viktor Yanukovych. And The memo also used legal mumbo-jumbo to essentially let Trump know that obstruction of justice is well within the purview of the special counsel. A woman who's caught in the Trump Twitter, Twitter crossfire with her husband, Andy McCabe, who is no longer the number two guy at the FBI, he was forced out by Trump Co., and they did it in a way that denied him his pension. And one of the attacks that Trump has repeatedly made is that Andy McCabe is compromised because his wife, Jill, who is an emergency room pediatrician, was recruited to run for the state Senate in Virginia and given campaign cash in 2015 by Governor Terry McAuliffe, who is a longtime bag man for the Clintons. And Trump's effort to link her to the Clintons through Terry McAuliffe is bizarre and irrational. It, it really doesn't pass a fundamental test. So I've linked to Jill McCabe's commentary, and I think she slaps Trump around pretty effectively. And she twice asserts that she never discussed Hillary Clinton's emails with Terry McAuliffe. Yesterday I shared with you how Sinclair, the largest single owner of local television stations in this country, forced most of its news anchors to recite a corporate written screed against fake news and the mainstream media. Well, one of the, at least one, of the Sinclair stations has a ballsy station manager who didn't run that promo. We don't know his name, but he is the GM in Madison, Wisconsin at Fox 47. And the station tweeted that it did not air the promotional announcement 
because we stayed true to our commitment to provide our Madison area, area viewers local news, weather, and sports of interest to them. But gosh, Fox 47, you don't really have control of your local news because you've got all those must-run inserts from Baltimore that turn your local newscast into a national right-wing propaganda machine. Now, Trump responded by defending Sinclair and the wonderful work that they do. (laughs) And he managed to use that as a reason to threaten Jeff Zucker and CNN. Now, you got to know the history. Zucker was running NBC. He was Donald Trump's boss during the Apprentice era. And Trump apparently felt that CNN was going to give him a break. Zucker did initially give Trump a lot of free coverage in uh, 2015 and early 2016. And then when he saw that Trump could become a contender, CNN got much more combative with Trump. But uh, what Trump is doing is uh, mentioning the current proposed acquisition of Time Warner by AT&T, which would give Jeff Zucker a new boss. And Trump seems to hope that he can leverage that to get Jeff Zucker fired. There is a new study reported out by the Washington Post today uh, where they this came from Ohio State University, and they make the claim here that the study shows that fake news might have provided the narrow margin that's called victory for Donald Trump. But I don't buy it. This survey basically just gave people a bunch of real news and they put in three fake stories and the people who could identify the fake stories were then further studied. And those who believe the fake stories were further studied. And they say that, well, maybe 4% of Democrats who voted for Obama in 12 were dissuaded from voting for Clinton in 16. But it didn't take fake news to change the minds of those voters. And fake news doesn't have much impact on people who have strong opinions. It's much more persuasive to people who don't have a clue. So, you can tell, I reject those findings. And there's more fact-checking of Trump (laughs) and his recent tweets. And I think we've bent your ear enough today. So I'll leave that for you to find. It's at the Washington Post if you really care. But you kind of know, and it's no spoiler alert, you know how that one ends. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. It's available free. You can share it with absolutely everyone. And we post it on YouTube. I'm Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you, keep smiling up.